we should start to be on schedule. So my name's Rob Picard. I'm the outgoing chair of the academic section. And um, Howard Kynaston here is the incoming chair of the academic uh, section. So it's my pleasure to introduce our, my last um, um, academic section meeting in Baus, uh, 2015. And um, thank you very much for coming on such an early start on um, Thursday of Baus. And um, we've got um, what you might call an action-packed program, uh, which covers um, a sort of celebration, if you like, of the best in academic um, urology over the past 12 months, both in terms of the papers that have been submitted to, to Baus 2015, and then the prize lecture, the John Blandy Prize, um, sponsored by the BJU International, their best um, publication of the last 12 months and then the um, student essay prize. So then there'd be a break at um, 10.30, just for a quarter of an hour. Um, I think the refreshments will be in, in the lobby, I think. Um, and then we've got our two sort of academic uh, um, sessions. Firstly, on uh, a big emerging topic, which <laughs> is surprisingly a theme of the whole bounce, I think, because... Um, um, Yep, there are about three or four sessions on urine infection. And then our second section is a um, joint session organised by Howard and um, Joe Cresswell on emerging topics in um, urological oncology. And then finally, um, the younger academic um, trainees um, under the burst umbrella will be having their session from half past three to half past four. So I think without any further preamble, welcome again. And we'll start off with the... Um, first session, which is the best ac academic um, paper session. So what we're going to have is six. So this is chosen from the Baus Abstract Selection Committee, have selected the six um, submissions that um, encompass the best in academic endeavour, whether that's in the laboratory or whether it's in clinical work, particularly in clinical trials. So each um, presenter has a maximum of 10 minutes, but um, hopefully a little bit less than that. So hopefully about six or seven minutes of talking, followed by three minutes of discussion. Um, so I've just got to find the order of the abstracts. So the first um, presentation is by Dr. Malkiism. Brilliant. So it's the role of preoperative histology in nephroureterectomy. And the other thing to say, sorry, is that there will be a prize for the best of the best. So there will be a prize for the best presentation encompassing the abstract, the quality of the presentation and the quality of the included science, which will be judged by three of us and the winner announced um, after the session. So, sorry, thank you. no pressure there, Mr. <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the opportunity to present our study on uh, the role of preoperative histology in nephroureterectomy. We're representing the UK experience. Um, diagnosis and management of upper tract TCC has evolved in recent years. Uh, just a quick uh, reminder of the EAU guidelines regarding diagnosis of uh, upper tract TCC. We can see EAU recommend urine cytology, cystoscopy, and CT urography as recommendation A, and recommend diagnostic ureteroscopy and biopsy as recommendation C. Um, but it does say that we should be able to offer urethroscopy and biopsy for all patients being assessed uh, for upper tract TCC. Quick reminder of uh, management of upper tract TCC. Conservative management should be considered in patients with a unifocal tumor with a tumor size less, less than one centimeter and low grade. Um, Radical nephroureterectomy, which is the gold standard, normally um, being offered for the, for the rest of the patients, essentially. In the literature, there were two studies in the past reported the incidence of benign histology following nephroureterectomies. The first study was performed by Chitali Group from Norwich, reported the benign um, uh, his histology following nephroureterectomy at 10.25%. More recent study um, from the Hong Group from uh, Korea reported the benign histology at 2.9%. 
So the objective is study to present the UK practice in terms of uh, pre-operative management of upper tract ECC and to evaluate the role of pre-operative histology. So we looked at uh, the BAUS database for 2012-2013 um, for uh, nephrorectomies. And we found that there were, there were 2018 patients had nephrorectomies. We, we had to uh, exclude some of the patients from incomplete information or nephrorectomy being done for benign, known benign disease. So that left us with 1,930 patients. 1,560 patients didn't have any cytological order uh, or histological confirmation prior to nephrorectomy, and 370 patients, they had either uh, cytological or histological or both prior to um, nephrorectomies. Um, this is to reflect the modality of treatment. Most of the patients there had laparoscopic surgery in both groups. Um, this to present the, the group B, the one that they had, uh, preoperative histology and, cytological and or cytological diagnosis. So a third of the patients had only histological diagnosis, a third of them they had only cytological diagnosis, and one third had both. This is a final surgical pathology in group A, the one that didn't have any, any preoperative cytological or histological diagnosis. So 98% of the patient came back with mal um, histology of malignancy. Out of this, 85% they came back with a TCC and 9% of RCC. Now going to the benign group, which was 1%, it's actually 0.9%. So this patient, they thought to have cancer on the CT scan, been operated on, came back with benign pathology of 0.9%. Compare this to the group B, the one that had a cytological and, and or histological diagnosis. 92% um, they were malignant at the, at the final histology, and there were 2% benign. So um, there were actually eight patients out of the 370. And out of the eight patients, there were four patients, they had histological diagnosis of TCC, and there were nothing found on the uh, final um, histology. And the other four patients, they had abnormal cytology. Um, looking at the grade of the TCC in group A, um, so majority of the patients they had G2 and G3 disease, and some of them they had CIS as well. Now, the other, the other diagram shows the size of the tumor in G1 disease group. So G1 disease group, there were 63 patients. Um, only nine patients, they had less than one centimeter TCC, and four out of the nine patients, they had CIS as well. This is to compare between both groups, between group A and group B, the final uh, grading of the TCC. Um, we looked in more detail into the, um, the benign final surgical pathology in group A again. So there were a total of 13 patients, that are equal to 0.9%. Um, two of them, they were worked up for renal mass on the CT scan. 11 of them, they worked up as TCC. Um, one patient had an additional TRBT and one patient had cystoprostectomy at the time of the operation. Um, complication, there was one death at day 33, but patient had ASA score of three and had multiple comorbidities. And there was one grade one, one grade two complication following, uh, operate, following the nephrorectomies. Conclusions, um, pre-operative management of upper tract TCC varies among the UK units. Uh, more than 80% of the patients, they had the nephrorectomy with no histological or cytological confirmation. The incidence of benign histology finding is below in both groups. And this study rep reports significantly lower incidence of benign um, final histology um, compared to previous studies. And we think that preoperative histological confirmation should be advised in patients with a high risk. And this study emphasized the importance of accurate data entry to BAUS database as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. So very well presented. Any questions um, from the floor? Yes, gentlemen at the back. Yeah, I mean, we, the, the, 
the conclusion was it should be recommended in a high risk patient when if you're going to operate on patients with ASA three, we probably the one that we should be Okay, so high anesthetic risk. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't have the answer for that question. Um, it, it, it was just a reflection of the PAPS database. It didn't include any patient that were uh, considered for chemotherapy, I'm afraid. Um, it would be nice when you wrote this up. It would be nice to look at. I mean, I think most people would expect a great one disease is not going to be invasive. But the guys who've got grade three, and, you know, we're talking about the patients who are the most at risk of Yeah, sorry, um, him at the back. Uh, Tim O'Brien. Um, thank you. Um, in fact, your results are exactly the same as a previous British study on this subject. Uh, the Ogmin C trial was run across 44 hospitals in the United Kingdom, and the rate of benign histology was 3 out of 284, which I think is 0.9%. So that study ran between 1999 and 2006. So I think your study suggests actually the practice is exactly the same as it was, hasn't changed. Um, the conclusion on it, I would agree with Jim that I wouldn't say there's a rate of 1% necessitated for pre-op biopsy, but there is a previous British study. It showed exactly the same results. Any other points? I think both to compass it's, you know, the point is there's only point in knowing if you're going to change management, I guess. Yes. So obviously you would have changed management in the 2% of the benign, whereas the others, what other option did they have? Do you think some of them could have had um, endoscopic local treatment if they had low grade Diagnosed prior to well, if, uh, definitely, if they have low um, low volume, low grade tumor, then uh, uh, low grade tumor, then you can offer them uh, endoscopic management of uh, upper tract TCC in high risk patients, especially. But um, it's, um, the gold standard remains nephri retracting for most of these patients, essentially. So, okay. If there are no other questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the next um, presentation. Thomas, who's going to talk about the two-year follow-up of the Goliath trial. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, if I can set the scene, um, a health technology appraisal um, in the surgical treatments of BP in 2008 by Lorenko suggested that laser vaporization of the prostate was probably not as effective as the gold standard TURP and was uh, uh, probably not going to be cost-effective. Uh, that most of the publications for, were from NDIAG, but there was one publication from 80 watts first generation green light laser. Uh, subsequently, uh, an updated version of the guidance was uh, used by, by NICE to produce the LUTS guidance CG97 that uh, suggested that the green light laser should only be used in clinical trials only because of lack of uh, level one randomized evidence. Uh, in response to this, uh, to the NICE guidance, and with the genesis of a third uh, generation green light laser 180 watt system, the Goliath trial was commissioned. On behalf of a large group of European investigators and my core uh, principal investigator, Alex Bachmann, I'd like to present the 24 month results of the Goliath trial. The Goliath trial was an open labelled, uh, prospective, randomised, multi centre trial. Uh, comparing a green light laser uh, XPS 180 watts versus TURP for LUTS PPH. This was a, a non inferiority study and the first green light study uh, powered for safety, efficacy, and durability. Uh, there were 291 patients uh, recruited to trial between 2011 and 2012. 281 were randomised and 269 patients were, were treated. 136 with green light and 133 with uh, TURP. 
92% of the patients remain in the trial at, uh, at two years. The patients were uh, between 40 and 80 years of age, ASA grade 1 to 3, had a prostate volume and trust less than 100 mils, and had an IPSS score greater than 12. Uh, the primary uh, objectives were IPSS at six months, also QMAX at six months, and the complication-free rate uh, at six months. There were many secondary uh, objectives, uh, length of catheterization, length of hospitalization. Uh, time to stable health status was a study definition of the time the, period of the patient left the recovery room to the time the patient was fit to, for discharge. That's with, in the absence of a catheter, with a patient voiding, and the absence of a complication or haematuria. This was designed to take into account uh, other hospital systems in Europe having to uh, discharge patients for, for different reasons. Uh, post void residual urine and prostate volume reduction was assessed by TRUSS and using PSA as a nadir. So these were our primary results. Uh, the, the red line is uh, green light, uh, the mean IPSS score for green light, and the yellow uh, arrow is the mean IPSS for TURP. We see a similar drop uh, in a mean IPSS from baseline in, uh, at six months, which is carried through to 24 months. Similarly with uh, QMAX, uh, green light is uh, in green and TURP in blue. We see a similar increase in uh, QMAX at six months, maintain the 24 months. The mean uh, QMAX for uh, green light is 20.6 mils per second. The mean QMAX for TURP, 21.9 mils per second. Uh, Complication-free rates. Uh, there was no significant difference at 6, 12, or 24 months. 87% of green light patients were complication-free rated at, uh, at 6 months, falling to 83.6% uh, at 24 months. And simply with TURP, 83% at 6 months, dropping to 78% at 24 months. No significant difference. Um, one of the strengths of the trial was that the adverse events were judged by an independent body of uh, consultants. There were three consultants who were blinded to which treatment the patient had undergone. The most common clavian dindo uh, grade 1 complication was irritative symptoms, which occurred in 18.4% with green light and 18% with TURP. A clavian dindo grade 2 was uh, UTI, which is 14.9% with green light versus 8% with uh, TURP. That was not significant. There were no grade uh, 4 or grade 5 complications. If you look at grade 3 dindo complications, those required in surgical intervention, in the first 30 days, there was significantly fewer uh, of these complications with green light than uh, TURP. These main complications were retention and, uh, and, uh, and bleeding. By 24 months, there was no significant difference uh, between green light and TURP. Uh, in, the in, the in, in the intervening period, uh, bladder nexinosis was numerically more common with green light and occurred in smaller prostate volumes, and uh, uh, stricture was more common with TURP, again, in bigger prostate volumes as expected. Uh, there were many secondary objectives. Uh, the quality of life score in the IPSS and post void residual was identical at uh, six months and 24 months with both techniques. If you look at prostate vo uh, trust prostate volume, the mean prostate volume with uh, green light was 48 mils, dropping down to 23.9 mils at uh, two years, compared with 46 mils uh, for TURP, dropping down to 22.4 mils. No significant difference, that is, the, uh, the mean prostate volume treated by TURP and green laser are both the same. With PSA, there was a slower drop in PSA with green light at six months, but at 24 months there was no significant difference, suggesting the same volume of tissue treated by both, uh, both techniques. Erectile function, there were only four de novo cases of erectile dysfunction in the whole study, three with TURP, one with green light. 70% uh, of men had retrograde ejaculation at two years with TURP or green lights. The mean IIF5 score uh, changed, there was very little change uh, from baseline, as you can see, and there was no significant difference between the two techniques. If you look at recovery parameters, the y axis here is medians in hours. Uh, there was significant benefit with, with green light over TURP for catheterization time, 
tight and stable health status and hospital stay. You may, you may, you may think the hospital stay here perhaps isn't representative of, of UK practice, and this is the breakdown of 88 patients from the trial uh, from the UK, 48 green light, 40 TURP. We see that the median length of, of, of hospital stay for green light is 28.7 hours versus 52.4 hours for TURP. We conclude that the Goliath study is the first prospective randomised trial of green light laser XPS versus TURP, powered for both efficacy and safety. At 24 months, a green light is inferior, is not inferior to TURP in terms of IPSS, QMAX, and the complication free rate. Uh, also, the multiple secondary endpoints assessed show no significant difference. We remove an equivalent uh, amount of prostate uh, BPS tissue with both a green light and TURP. Uh, re intervention rates were fewer with green light layers in the first 30 days, but at 24 months, there's no significant difference. And this is achieved with, uh, with shorter uh, catheterization times and length of hospital stay for green light in favour of TURP. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So good to see a device manufacturer sponsoring an RCT, which their pharma colleagues have had to do for a long time, but it's great to see a device manufacturer following suit now. Any questions from the floor? We've got a couple of minutes for questions. Can I just answer two questions? Yeah, there should be a microphone coming the, the, for anybody else. Two questions. The, the first question, it's a very small number for a non-inferiority trial, and I wonder how you calculated the statistics for that. Usually you have to have very large trials for non-inferiority to show any difference. Yeah, it's power to... Uh, second second okay. question, okay. I've taken one at a time. Um, the second question is you've presented your secondary outcome measure as hours in hospital, which is a very difficult thing to measure in a most unusual way to present time in hospital. Can you tell me how you defined the point at which the patient was discharged? Okay, the, um, the trial was powered for an 80% uh, power to uh, determine non-inferiority kind of at, at six months. That was the, um, uh, we needed, uh, at the top of my head, we needed, I think it's 113 patients in each arm of the trial, so we actually kind of exceeded the number we required. Um, second question, uh, the, each unit could, could, would discharge their patients as per normal basis, basically, so there's no kind of, uh, there's no specific kind of uh, uh, po uh, indication for when the patient got discharged. So it was the routine practice of each of those uh, 29 centres. So just to come back at you, um, a 20% difference in a non-inferiority trial is a very big difference. It's unachievable virtually, I would put to you. The second is that uh, as a secondary endpoint, you really can't declare hours as a measure if you're as poorly defined as you are currently with your answer. Well, there were multiple kind of uh, endpoints for kind of uh, discharge. There was, you know, there was not just the hours in hospital. There was the tight and stable health status, and there was kind of. Uh, I'm not disputing stay. that, but but you, you, one of the big marketing points for this will be time in hospital, which you're presenting as hours, and actually you haven't measured it properly. So I'm not sure that it's valid to present that. It's just the unit may be better as days rather than hours. Possibly. Anyway. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, um, one question. I have to be quick, though. Nick. Um, the fact that I'm very impressed with your trial, but is this a tacit admission that the previously powered machines weren't good enough when we were told at the time? That they, they were probably good enough, so you've increased the power. Are you saying that units now with lower power machines shouldn't be using them? Um, well, certainly the, the XPS system with a range of power from uh, you know, 20 watts to 180 watts is uh, sufficient power to treat uh, most prostate volumes. And I think, uh, I think the 80 watt system was probably was under powers. The 120 watt system uh, probably had sufficient power, but the fibre uh, probably wasn't as good. And I, think that, and I think what's important with the third generation system, there's adequate power, plus the MOXIE fibre delivery system is uh, an equal benefit, really. So I think the combination of the, uh, the enhanced power and the fibre delivery, delivery system uh, is, is the optimum system. OK, thank you very much. <laughs> I'd like to ask um, the next speaker, uh, Dr Farrell. So we're going into the laboratory now, I think, are we? From the clinical yeah. to the, from the clinic to the laboratory. Looking at uh, markers of 
EM transition in the prostate. Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present some of our work today. So my name is Richard Bryant. I'm an academic urologist uh, based in Oxford. Um, and as many of you will know, epithelial to mesenchymal transition is increasingly being recognised as an important biological phenomenon that occurs in many adenocarcinoma types. And basically, this describes a process whereby epithelial cells undergo changes uh, and develop a phenotype of uh, a more mesenchymal cell type. So this will include the loss of adherens and tight junctions, a loss of desmosomes, a change in apical basal polarity, and loss of epithelial markers such as ecoderin. So basically these otherwise stationary epithelial cells become motile, uh, very much akin to the sort of embryonic mesenchymal cells whereby cells become much more motile, they uh, develop focal adhesions to basement membrane and basically crawl and become invasive. So it's known that EMT occurs in many cancer types and in fact it has well been recognised in prostate cancer, but hitherto what's, known, or what's not known is which part of the prostate cancer tumour actually um, might have EMT uh, undergoing within it. So we asked the question whether EMT occurs specifically at the leading edge of locally invasive PT3A prostate cancers. So we used immunohistochemistry of whole mount sections uh, taken from 27 radical prostatectomy specimens that have been very carefully characterised by our uropathologists. Um, we looked to see whether any changes in 11 well-studied EMT proteins might be occurring within the leading edge of this uh, invasive uh, subtype of prostate cancer. And I've listed here the 27, uh, sorry, the, um, the 11 EMT proteins that we looked at. We can talk about that perhaps in more detail later. Um, but we also then looked to see whether any of the changes that we might see in any of these human samples might be observed in other models that we use in the lab. And specifically, we looked at a P10 knockout mouse model of prostate cancer, and we also looked at an organotypical in vitro cell line uh, model of invasive disease to see whether any of these changes, if we were to see any, were occurring in any of those models. So when we looked at the 27 PT3A prostate cancer cases, and this was all done by a dedicated uropathologist um, with uh, uh, a number of internal controls for validity, we basically saw that three of the 11 EMT proteins had significant changes. And in particular, we saw that the cytoplasmic subcellular localization of alpha smooth muscle actin was significantly higher, as indicated by the red bar in the top of that uh, panel. We also saw uh, two significant changes in ecoderin, and this was again a gain in cytoplasmic localization and a loss of membranous localization. And we also saw a change in snail membranous localization. And these, when we did the statistics for this, we corrected for multiple tests using a bronferoni correction. So having seen three of the changes, three of the uh, proteins changed in the uh, human samples, we then looked at the mouse model. And importantly here, we looked at each of the different lobes of the mouse uh, prostate. And we saw again that two of these proteins were significantly altered in the locally invasive prostate tumors in the mice. Uh, these were the changes in the cytoplasmic alpha smooth muscle acting and ecoderin. And then we also looked at the cell line model. As many of you will know, there are three main cell lines that are used in prostate cancer research. Uh, DU145, which are, which are invasive, PC3, which are also invasive, and LNCAP, which tend to be non-invasive. And of these three cell lines, when we looked at each of the uh, EMT markers, we saw a change in membranous ecoderin loss in the PC3 cells. So in summary, I hope that I've shown you that the expression profiles of three of these EMT proteins are indeed significantly different in the extraprostatic extension component of locally advanced prostate cancers compared with the intraprostatic portion of that same tumor focus. And in fact, of our 27 cases, 18 of these had a significant change in at least one EMT protein. And this is the first study that I'm aware of that has shown that EMT changes are occurring at the leading edge of locally invasive prostate cancers. Of the three significantly altered proteins in the human samples, two of these were showing sig uh, similar significantly altered changes in a mouse model of invasive adenocarcinoma of the prostate. 
and one of these cell, uh, proteins also had changes in the cell line models. So these re results would suggest that changes in EMT proteins can be observed in the extraprostatic extension of locally invasive prostate cancers, and that the biology of some of these changes, although not all, can be studied in the currently available in vivo and in, in vitro um, basic science models. And I would suggest that experiments to identify the clinical use of an analysis such as this of EMT-related proteins um, in radical prostatectomy samples may now be warranted. And as a follow-up to that, um, we've recently had a paper published uh, which demonstrates that the, um, the ability of pathologists to actually accurately classify um, T2 versus T3A disease um, could perhaps be improved. And I would suggest that perhaps one use of these uh, immunohistochemistry stainings of EMT proteins might be to best uh, or to better aid the pathologists in accurate T staging after radical prostatectomy. So I'd just like to thank by acknowledging the sources of funding, which was the Oxfordshire Health Research uh, Health Sciences Research Committee uh, for funding us for the various antibodies. And I'd also like to thank CRUK and NIHR and the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research, where we undertook these bench top studies. And I'll welcome any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> any questions um, from the floor? Yes. Um, sorry. Yeah. Um, can we have a microphone? It's interesting that uh, it seemed to me, looking at your images, that there were different proteins for different uh, cell lines. Given that there are very few prostate cancer cell lines compared with other cancers, do other cancers have a plethora of uh, markers? Is, is that pattern observed with other cancers, other cell lines? So some of the changes that we observed have been seen in pancreatic cancer which is a cancer that's well studied in terms of the EMT phenotype. And indeed, some of the changes that we were seeing, particularly the changes in um, alpha smooth muscolactin and hecaterin, they've been previously um, described in pancreatic cancer. They've also been described in prostate cancer, but not in specific areas of the tumor. So as I mentioned at the start, the key hypothesis is could we observe these changes in the leading edge of T3A disease? Um, and indeed, that, I would suggest, is indeed what we're seeing. Of course, what we don't know is whether the, the tumor cells that are at the invasive leading edge are, are indeed the cells that will become metastatic. Um, and that's not, that's not known at this moment in time. Did you look at other cadherins as well, N-cadherin? And... So we did include N-cadherin, and we didn't see a significant change in N-cadherin once we'd corrected for the multiple T-testing when you look at um, 11 proteins in 27 cases. Only three of them were statistically significant once you'd applied the bond for only correction, and cadherin wasn't one of those. Thank you. Professor Clark? Uh, yeah, a question, but a, a comment, first of all. I'd just be a little careful saying you were the first to do this because uh, I'd refer you back to Gordon Bryden's work on uh, E. cadherin and beta catenin and the leading edge of uh, prostate cancers, which was published uh, probably about 15 years ago. Um, regarding EMT, um, I mean, your, your, your results are at variance with uh, Rob Reiter's work on N-cadherin and down regulation. Um, so perhaps you might want to look at the Nature paper on that. And the, the real question is, I'm not really clear how you showed the leading edge in your in vitro models. Okay, so the, so the in vitro model is um, where the cells are grown on a collagen matrigel matrix with a... Um, feeder layer of fibroblasts beneath um, and basically you grow the cells on the upper surface um, and then at specified time points you fix and section the sample so that then you look in cross-section at the and you can compare the most or the deepest cells within the matrix which have by definition invaded so it's quite clear when you look at these down a microscope uh, that the cells that are in the deepest layer um, have truly invaded, and you don't see those cells invading in the LNCAP cell line. Well, um, LNCAP's not an invasive cell line. Well, no, line. so you don't see that, that they've invaded, but the other two cell lines have invaded, and you, then a pathologist can score the lowermost cells in terms of their expression profile compared to the uppermost cells. And the then you can do some analysis based on that. Yeah, the, the only other word of caution I would add is that although EMT and mesenchymal transition is clearly important, it is a dynamic phenomenon. Sure. So that uh, when you're looking at endothelial transition, 
Yeah. That's a meboid rather than yeah. using chymal. Yeah. Uh, so and, and, I, and the other thing I would say is that it's not an all or nothing phenomenon, as yeah. I'm sure perhaps these results would yeah. suggest. Okay. Thank you very much. So the next presenter, I'll get the name right this time, is um, Jim Cato from Sheffield, Sheffield. And we're moving on to epidemiology, I think, aren't we? Yeah. So dry science, I guess. Do I find it on here? Oh dear. There it is. Oh, got yeah. <laughs> Classic. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm here on behalf of Aidan Noon, who's uh, one of our fellows who's uh, abroad at the moment. So um, uh, we're here to talk about workplace platins and urethelial bladder cancer. Um, I think for many years it's been recognised, well, for more than 50 years, it's been recognised that occupational carcinogen exposure is probably the second commonest uh, carcinogen or carcinogenic cause for bladder cancer. But we've been working on a, a hypothesis for a while that it's not just that the cancers are caused by the carcinogen, but perhaps the carcinogen can dictate the phenotype of those cancers. And in other non-bladder cancers, there are certainly some specific phenotypes that follow viral infection, tobacco smoke, uh, etc. So we were really trying to explore that. We've done a couple of local studies where we've shown that heavy metal use can perhaps give you more grade 3 disease. But they were very underpowered given sort of the natural history and the cohorts we had available to us. So we were looking for larger collaborations and we came across the NOCA study, which is the sort of Scandinavian Nordic occupational collaboration. And you can imagine they have millions of people followed for millions of years with the typical Scandinavian obsessiveness about occupation. One of the cohorts, the Finnish arm, has complete annotation for the type of tumour. So we approached uh, the Finnish lead for this, and they agreed to collaborate. So they, collab they recruited prospectively from 1971 to 2005. Uh, all people in Finland have been followed, and their occupation matched by a job exposure matrix, which groups according to 55 different uh, classifications, which are well recognized in the epidemiology field. Um, they followed by person years from the date of recruitment to death or end of study. And we were able to stratify by bladder cancer incidence the stage, which, uh, which one of the main weaknesses is that the stage is between localised and advanced. But localised isn't as we would recognise it. It is T2 disease and lower. So when they say advanced, they're talking about T3, T4 or metastatic disease. And then we had uh, disease-specific mortality. And then we could compare that to the entire Finnish population which is important because one of the other weaknesses is the lack of personalised smoking data. But they do have accurate smoking data in each occupation. So there were 1.6 million men and 1.7 million women, and they were followed for approximately 37 and 42 million years in terms of uh, person years. Bladder cancer was seen in 13,700 men and 4,000 women in a ratio of 3.2 to 1, which is very typical. Localised bladder cancer was present in uh, just under 9,000 and advanced disease in about 1.4,000. In females, we saw 2.6 thousand with localised and 520, 592 with advanced disease. This probably won't project extremely well. The, the column on the right is those people with localised disease and the ones with green boxes have a higher incidence of localised disease than would be expected. And you can see numerous occupations including drivers, uh, engineers, um, plumbers, various other sorts. The middle column is those who've got more advanced disease than is expected. So the red boxes are occupations where they've got a significant increase in advanced disease. So for that we see um, the mixed building sectors, uh, seamen and uh, welders. Seamen are commonly associated with bladder cancer, and we think it's to do diesel, diesel fumes. On, on boats, they have diesel engines, they have very high inhalation of diesel fumes. And on the right-hand column, sorry, the, the furthest right, it's where we have the ratio of localised to advanced. So the red boxes, which is the mixed uh, building trades, you have significantly more advanced disease in that cohort than you'd expect compared to the other ones. The green boxes, you've got significantly more localised disease. And one of the examples there is the um, rubber and dye industry, so the chemical industry, which is the top one, we have an odds ratio of 5.1. And what we think happens there is that there's a very good screening program, so people pick up their disease quite early, they're detected, and therefore they have a significant increase in disease, but it's at a lower stage. This is for females, and, the, and effectively you see the same thing for females with the mixed building sector coming up as the significantly worse advanced disease than we thought. Um, we also have mortality, so bladder cancer mortality occurred in 3.6 thousand men, 1.4 thousand women, and again we see, uh, consistent with the data there, worse outcomes from women with bladder cancer than with men. 
And we see here again that the main, the main things of interest here is it's the associated and the mixed building construction workers who have significantly worse mortality than you'd expect um, than uh, otherwise for men. And for women, we see similar things with, with the worst uh, outcomes in the mixed building uh, construction workers and in waiters. So, uh, in summary, um, we saw various patterns. We saw an increased mortality, increased incidence in many occupations, many of which are known. But what was interesting to us is that you had better outcomes than expected if you worked in the chemical process environment, in the military personnel, and in public safety workers. And we expect that they've all got good um, workplace hygiene. They've probably got good occupational health programs going on that are screening these people. And they're relatively uh, well-educated patients, so that if they have symptoms, they're unlikely to ignore them. But for both male and females, we had far more advanced and far more, far more mortality in the sort of associated and the miscellaneous building construction workers, which for us is interesting but slightly disappointing. We had hoped that we would identify some occupations where you could put some energy into screening or you could target the screening in that environment. But this uh, construction, this miscellaneous construction sector is extremely diverse. The patterns of occupation occupational tasks and smoking prevalence and education are very poor and so it's going to be difficult to move forward to work out exactly which is the carcinogen here. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Jim. Some interesting occupational population data. Yeah. Frank. Thanks Jim. Did you stratify for smoking? Well again we didn't have individual smoking. We stratified and adjusted by the occupational rates. So in Finland, for each of their 55 occupations, they have a rough uh, rate of, or a fairly accurate rate of smoking within that. So we were able to adjust for a population, but not in individuals, unfortunately. And we also struggle where people chop and change between industry. So, you know, it sounds very nice as long as you've got one job for life, but in reality, a lot of the um, people at risk here are moving between industrial sectors all the time, and so they are difficult to adjust for. So, so there was no uh, calculation for time in an industry? No, we didn't have that information. Thank you. Tim? It does seem like this may have more to say about access to health care and yep. people's behaviour, doesn't it? What about other diseases, uh, other conditions? Could they act as a control in judging whether it's to do with people's behaviour rather than the actual carcinogen? We looked at lung cancer because we felt that might be related. And in general, you see similar trends in lung cancer. So I think you're probably right. Um, I think the, I mean, the interesting thing for us was the chemical workers, and also, the, I didn't really focus on it, but health professionals do very well. So doctors and nurses have higher rates of localised disease, but it drops off in terms of mortality. So I think, you know, in educated uh, populations, they seek medical, prefer you know, medical attention quite early on. So you're, you're probably right, you know, for that. Okay, another question at the front here. If you'd like to stand up, the microphone's just come in, yeah. Um, you shared that the incidence ratios were higher in those specific groups. What was your reference group? Well, divided by themselves. So we, we, we effectively decided that we would um, work out the risks of advanced disease divided by localised disease in those populations. Okay. The epidemiologist told me that's the way to present the data. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So presentation number five is by Dr... But is it? Mm. Not here. No. Okay, so on to number six. Um, Dr. Fernando is going to be exploring the potential of um, PET in retroperitoneal fibrosis. It is Dr. Fernando. Is it? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Let me present her. Okay. Sorry, we're just slightly you? thrown by the fact that number five wasn't here. <laughs> um, good morning. I am very excited to be here at the start of BAUS 2015 um, to talk to you about CT PET and RPF. So PET has completely changed the way that we manage RPF, and I hope that by the end it will be clear why. Because RPF is a rare disease, there are a lot of questions that are difficult to answer. Should everyone have a biopsy? Should everyone have steroids? If not, who should have steroids? 
Is the RPF active or inactive? Who should have a urethrolysis? In order to answer some of these questions, we've been carefully studying RPF patients through a multidisciplinary RPF service over the last three years. And just last week, we received our referral for the 93rd patient. These patients have allowed us to put together the pieces of the RPF puzzle, but it's been looking very grayscale. And what the PET has done is it has provided the color needed to complete the picture. And here are the ways that PET has really helped us out. Diagnosis. Clearly, it's important when managing RPF not to miss malignancy. This is the PET at the CT of a 68-year-old uh, retired builder from Brighton. And he had two biopsies of this retroperitoneal mass, which showed fibrosis. Now, before I show you his PET, I'm going to show you this PET. And this is the PET of someone with typical RPF. And you can see that hot donut around the aorta. And this is his PET. And it's clear here that malignant PET does not look like RPF. It's not only positive, but it looks completely different. And the third biopsy showed lymphoma. So the PET in this case was life-saving. At the other end of the spectrum, if your PET is negative, your chance of malignancy is zero in this series. None of our 19 patients who had a negative PET had malignancy on biopsy. So it may be that we can exclude routine biopsy in these cases. PET has also helped us in unexpected ways. In this man, we were really focusing in on the retroperitoneum. And you can see he's also got obstruction. Uh, the picture was a little unclear, rather like the picture on your screen. And uh, what the PET has done is provided focus. You can see there in the axilla is a really hot blob. And that, on biopsy, showed metastatic melanoma in the axilla. And this man has what we think is a new subtype of RPF, paraneoplastic RPF. So those are the ways PET can help with diagnosis. What about treatment? Currently, steroids are a knee-jerk reaction to a diagnosis of RPF. And the, the same was true for us until we noticed this. If your PET is negative, none of those patients had a shrinkage in their mass with steroids. If the PET was weakly positive, pretty much the similar was true. And this is completely in keeping with what you would expect. Steroids are designed to suppress <coughs> inflammation. So if there's no inflammation, why should they work? Clearly, there's a benefit in giving steroids to people who have high activity in the retroperitoneum. So if steroids don't work to shrink an inactive mass, do they work to relieve obstruction from an inactive mass? This is the timeline of a uh, patient from Bromley, bus driver. And over three years, he's had multiple stent changes, he's had steroids, and finally, he ends up having a urethrolysis because his mass hasn't shrunk and he continues to have obstruction. And I suppose the question is, could we have cut out those 10 middle steps had we known that his PET was negative and he wasn't going to respond to steroids? And could he have gone from diagnosis to urethrolysis much quicker? I'm talking about negative and inactive. I'm talking about positive and active. And is there a better way than PET to decide between the two? And currently, you, we use inflammatory markers. This is a Jamaican lady, young lady with RPF. She's also got SLE. She's on steroids. She's got obstruction. And she comes into the clinic with some loin pain. And her inflammatory markers are raised. And this is her CT. Now, the question is, what is the source of her raised inflammatory markers? Is it activity in the RPF? Is it her SLE? Is it her obstructed kidney? Is it her recent stent change? And it's very difficult to work that out. And the PET can help. If the PET is negative in the retroperitoneum, we need to look for another source of her raised inflammatory markers. And this has been true throughout the whole cohort. About a third of the time, the inflammatory markers present a very different picture to the PET. And looking at it in, in a different way, the specificity of inflammatory markers is just over 60%. So these are not an ideal way of monitoring disease activity. PET has given us a couple of unique insights. 
It's very difficult to know what happens if you don't treat someone with RPF. We don't have an insight into that. So here's one case. This man had no treatment. And you can see his pet goes from weakly positive to negative. And in fact, the mass is shrinking just on its own without any treatment. And there may be some other cases out there where this is the case. What about those patients who don't respond to steroids? This man has got hot activity on PET despite steroids, and we've been looking into the role of rituximab. And you can see here his PET goes from really hot to very mildly hot, and the mass is shrinking with rituximab. And this is providing great hope for our patients who are steroid refractory. So all these observations have allowed us to start developing a treatment algorithm. And I'll just show you a couple of aspects. We think if your pet is negative, you don't need a biopsy, you don't need steroids, and if you present with obstruction, you should have a conversation about urethrolysis up front, unless the patient's very keen to have long-term stent changes. If it's positive, we think that CT PET should be part of your monitoring pathway and help decide whether the steroids are working or not. And if it continues to be positive despite steroids, then there may be a role for rituximab. So we started with a lot of questions. Who should have a biopsy? Is this malignant? Is it active or inactive? And this can't answer those questions. But this maybe can. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, some data to s perhaps suggest a change in practice. Any questions um, from the floor? I was interested in the, so the marker you use is the um, fluorodeoxyglucose. So is that, is there a choice in markers? Why did you choose that marker in there? Yeah, so the main uh, types of PET that are out there are choline and FTG. Um, there isn't really any evidence for choline in RPF. Uh, and the reason for that is choline is more um, of a, it's a, um, a cell wall component. And so it's very good for areas where there's high uh, cell turnover or increased cell proliferation, like in malignancy. FDG is um, linked to glucose activity in fibroblasts, and so much better for areas where there's inflammation. And so most of the uh, PET uh, that's looking for inflammation is using FDG. So going on from that, could you use both then if you were trying to look for malignancy and for inflammatory change? Yes, I suppose if you're looking for malignancy, you could use um, choline. But actually, we found that the FDG uh, lights up malignant cases really obviously. Um, of the four malignant cases that have had PET all over the report, there's malignancy, suspicious, abnormal, written all over it. It's really hard to miss, even with the, just the FDG. Any questions? Yeah, uh, Professor Clark. A structure on this uh, and that's very welcome um, and it's interesting that the negative uh, pets uh, are pretty much like the seminomas which is uh, virtually 100% accurate. My question really relates to the positive pet and how are you going to take this forward because at the minute a positive pet doesn't mean to say that you haven't got malignancy and it may just be an indicator that you've got the active phase of what's going on in the retroperitoneum. Now, in your algorithm, you had query biopsy. Shouldn't you be biopsying all of these prospectively to give us the answer, ultimately, on a sufficient number? Um, currently, we are biopsying all patients with a positive PET. I put query biopsy there um, really because we've noticed that the pattern of PET for people with malignancy is completely different to those with a positive RPF PET. But uh, we're not making that a strong recommendation. We're just trying to develop um, the algorithm, and that's why I've put query biopsy there. But currently, we are biopsying all those patients. Well, that's nice to know. Maybe you should take the query out. Yes, I will. Yes. Right. I guess following on from that, one of the, the issues is what constitutes a biopsy, because you may need to take quite an extensive biopsy to get an adequate number of cells. Just a simple biopsy, a punch biopsy, may, not, may be completely inadequate. 
Yes, absolutely. I think um, that the biopsy technique uh, that the radiologists use, they often use CT-guided biopsy, but you're right, it's very difficult to know have you got a representative sample. And certainly in the case of the lymphoma, you know, the two biopsies um, came up showing fibrosis and clearly they were inadequate. Um, but as you know, people are very nervous about biopsying in the retroperitoneum and perhaps in those situations where there's uncertainty and open or laparoscopic uh, biopsy is going to give you your best answer. The other caveat with the biopsy is often they've started steroids already, and so your picture is slightly muddled by that. So we would prefer to have biopsies before people start treatment. Um, sorry, we're subjecting you to a lot of questions. Because oh, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately your colleague didn't turn up. So, um, or not your colleague, but the other speaker, number five. So rare disease, to prove... The diagnostic accuracy, you're going to need, you know, more numbers. So, how are you going to take this forward to um, expand it into a proper, if you like, diagnostic accuracy? Yeah, it's too? an excellent question. I mean, because RPF is so rare in the context of RPF literature, this is the biggest series mm -hmm. on PET. The, the next biggest series is 25 patients out of the Netherlands. So, this is, you know, three or four times that. Um, it's very difficult to run a study, isn't it? I mean, it would be really great to see what happened if you didn't give steroids versus steroids mm. or steroids versus rituximab. Um, we just continuing to study the patients, and we're really what we're trying to do is get a really clean cohort of patients who come to us day one, have no treatment, have their biopsy, have their PET up front, and then we can really follow them through. And I think those are going to give us the, the, the best data. Um, and I think probably in this context that's going to give us Mm -hmm. the answers that we need. I think there's a fair amount of interest in research, in clinical research in rare diseases, you know, with a lot of funding attached. So, you know, it would be a typical topic that needs uh, setting up a national registry and then following on from that, um, either diagnostic trials or clinical trials. So yeah, I'd absolutely. encourage you to maybe try and Get set up a right. national registry because it would be perfect for Yeah, that, absolutely. Help. I think that's what we're uh, going to try and do. Mm. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for all the speakers uh, of this um, session. I think it did encompass across the whole realm of um, science, from, from lab science to epidemiology um, and to, to clinical studies, both in terms of diagnosis and um, treatment. So we've got three judges who are going to judge which one um, should win the prize in terms of the best um, paper at, at BAUS, so we'll be doing that. Um, and then at 10 o'clock, so we've got a five minute um, hiatus until the um, BJUI lecture, um, which Poker is here and is ready to introduce. So I think probably if we just um, talk amongst ourselves for five minutes and then um, Poker will be approaching the podium to come and introduce the um, lecture in a few minutes. <laughs>